So yeah, so I thought we were just gonna start off with uh, some introductions here so that you guys know uh, who's uh, speaking to you and everything. So I'm, I'm Justin Van Alstyne. I'm a senior corporate counsel of, of information governance and discovery over at T-Mobile. Um, and just a little bit of background like how I got into AI and things like that. Uh, you know, about five, six years ago, the legal world really started shifting uh, from using what, you know, things like search terms and very linear models like that towards uh, more iterative ones where we've been using machine learning, continuous active learning, TAR, things of that nature to locate, you know, important documents in our cases and things like that. So then that sort of naturally led me down the path of, you know, interacting with a lot of our engineers and devs uh, who do the work, you know, more for the business on that side too. Uh, so that's kind of how I got into this. And then, you know, I'm I'm basically an attorney who knows a little bit about this stuff, whereas these two guys are, are the real experts here. So I, I'm gonna be the moderator and I'll hopefully be asking good questions and we'll hopefully give you guys some good insights. But Mitch, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, I don't know about expert, but uh, my name is Mitch Gunnels. Uh, my title is Assistant Vice President of Technology for AT&T. And specifically, because at and is a big company, uh, I mostly focus on the tooling and automation for our planning, engineering, construction of mobility and fiber networks. Now, I said that's my title, but the reality is I'm a software engineer at heart. I have been from a very, very young age. Actually, to give you some context, my dad was a robotics engineer. I grew up building logic into circuitry, so in circuit boards. And it was at the time they explained to me, you know, the, the brain of the robot that it really intrigued me. Software was the way I wanted to go. And I've been with it ever since. And so much so, it's funny because, you know, we talk about AI automation. One big push at AT&T is really democratizing AI. So there's a lot of steps to get that get to there, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But, you know, there was a summit not too long ago, and we were looking at hey, what can the citizen developer do within AT&T? And part of the presentation was, hey, build a power app. And uh, I got excited. I was like, okay, well, I'm a developer. Definitely a citizen developer could do something, so I could do something pretty cool. So I ended up coding, uh, it was kind of funny, coding something that would take my emails coming in, put it in a database, and I decided, hey, you know, I want to get an alert when anybody in my chain of command uh, sends me an email. And on top of that, I'll add some sentiment to that do some analysis and let me know if this was an important email to look at. Well, turns out I'm not as good as I thought I was, and I ended up sending alerts to all of my chain of command every time an email came in. So I didn't even know I had done that until uh, my boss ended up saying, hey, why am I getting all these funky alerts from you? So, uh, you know, test your code, and maybe next time as the AI coding uh, community and codexes come out, maybe I'll just have them do it for me. But uh, I, I would, I'm just sorry, I, I'm not try, trying to ramble, but I would be remiss if I didn't tell you a little bit about at t here and our journey in AI. So number one, well, even before that, you know, we are one of the largest IoT companies in the world. Uh, we are currently fifth with the most AI patents in the United States. So we are a hardcore technology company in production, we have roughly 191 use cases where AI is being utilized, and we've been able to uh, show that we've actually, quantitatively, we've saved $2.5 billion so far. That's with a B, uh, just by implementing these AI use cases. And that was only out of 60 of those particular use cases, so we haven't been able to quantify the other, whatever, 131 use cases. So the, the number's gonna be way up there. And as I mentioned, we really have taken the approach of democratizing our data. Uh, now we're at the step of democratizing AI. And there's a lot to that. And definitely as we go along, I'll, I'll talk to it more. Thanks. Well, I'm glad I'm not following that introduction, but Sean, <laughs> you, get the, uh, you get the honor. I didn't want to tell our life story while we're yeah, up here too. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm Sean Kennedy. I lead the AI Research Lab at Bell Labs, um, which is owned by Nokia now, a telecommunication company, um, not phones. We sell everything that's in between your phones right now to these gentlemen, etc. 
Um, so, but that's not my job to sell stuff. I actually lead the AI research lab. And so we do fundamental research in, you know, how is AI and machine learning and mathematics and statistics, how is this changing the way that we think about telecommunication and industry 4.0, things like IOT, et cetera, in general. So my team is extremely broad and we cover, um, uh, pretty much, you know, everything that you will see here all the way from NLP because uh, we have a service business inside of Nokia, of course, and we use NLP to help understand our customers' needs so we can service them better. Uh, we do things like predictive maintenance. Uh, we, of course, do standard networking, and AI is integrating there as well. Um, and all the way to robotics, et cetera, because it's fun, interesting, and obviously is going to have a huge impact on the world. So I'll be happy to talk about some of those use cases uh, and ideas and some of the stuff that we're doing that maybe a little on the edge of uh, what's interesting, I suppose. Um, as for my background, um, I think I was resistant towards the ideas of machine learning because to me it seems kind of like cheating. So I'm a, <laughs> I'm a pure mathematician by training um, and I always thought we can just muscle our way through things. But of course, machine learning is changing that for some things, but only for some things, right? And I do think that there is this balance that we're starting to see with, uh, you know, see this with symbolic and AI coming back into fat, et cetera, that, you know, these ideas of data-driven uh, industries, et cetera, are good-ish, but they're incomplete, right? And so a lot, of, a lot of what my lab does in the end is not only use machine learning and AI to solve problems, but we use mathematics and we help to understand, you know, when, when are we supposed to use these things? When are they best to use? When do they give us the biggest advantage, et cetera? So maybe we can touch on that stuff later. Uh, and I'm from Canada. I've never been to Las Vegas, and this is my 12 hours here. I guess I'm really given a run of it. But anyways, that's another story for another time. <laughs> I can't remember the last time I did a 12-hour flight trip, so that's, yeah, I can imagine that's, that's a tough one. It's heroic. Right? Um, okay, so we were going to start off first with just uh, some like the use, use cases for AI. I was pretty much going to, we're pretty much going to go with Mitch and Sean first, and then I'm going to kind of give a little bit of background about some of the, like the, the uses that we have for them in the legal department, you know, as it comes to telecom issues. Um, so the first one I wanted to talk about was really network optimization, and I wanted to kick it over to Mitch to start off. What, what is really the use case there, and how do you guys see it? Like, is it just slicing, or, you know, what do you Oh, yeah, to? there's a lot there. Right. So, yeah. uh <laughs> You know, I broke this down into two parts. How are we using AI today and what does the future look like? So maybe later we'll, we'll talk about the future. But in, I mean, again, across the enterprise, we're using AI. And, you know, but to talk about network optimization, there's been a lot of enablers out there, especially, especially when we look at 5G in the cloud and, you know, where we're headed with that. But, you know, adaptive networking. So when we got to, and uh, Sean understands this, especially with software defined networks. You know, when we moved off of just switches and hardware that was specifically for one purpose and moved into software defined networking, we ended up getting to the ability to, you know, adapt our network. So as equipment fails, finding the best path forward without ever, without you ever find, even seeing an outage. Uh, and now we're moving to the things like pre predicting equipment outage. Uh, we use it for fiber planning optimization. So when we look at our fiber service area, what's called a pond service, service area, um, you know, a lot of times a planner has to come in, engineer has to come in, figure all of that out. And now we're starting to use AI to do a lot of that automatically for us. Now we have to tweak it, uh, but we're getting better in that feedback loop. So talking about customers and consumers, at and today uses real-time customer uh, to agent pairing. So if you were to call in and we knew what issue you were having, we definitely would pair you to a specialist to improve the outcome. And yeah, I got a list here. Uh, and when we do uh, dispatch automation. So we spend, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year in dispatch, whether that is going to fix a problem at the home or elsewhere, tower, backhaul, whatever, uh, you know, we spent a lot of money there. So we had to get into a better way of optimizing that so we could get the most jobs done with the least, mi least miles traveled and, uh, and just make it better for our techs. 
And speaking about that, uh, what we also do is we have something called as an in-home expert. So when that tech comes out to fix a problem, you know, we use AI and ML to upsell and cross-sell that particular customer. So whether it's a new install or we're fixing something, we have these in-home experts that, hey, they can look and see, hey, this person has a propensity to buy this particular product and uh, they can now upsell and cross-sell while they're in the home. And finally, in this morning's general session, H2O AI talked about our fraud reduction and how they've benefited us there. So we have a big problem in this industry with fraud. And we're starting to use AI and ML in order to reduce that type of fraud. Uh, they specifically talked about the iPhone use case, but we're ever continually evolving that, not just uh, in physical fraud. There's, there's other things that that happened. So if we look at like uh, cyber attacks that we're now beginning to uh, use AI to help us predict as well as prevent in the, even at the code layer. So those are some of our current AI uses. Right. And that, that's interesting you said that because I, I would say that for us, at least the, the fraud layer that you were just talking about is definitely one of the big ones, you know, with say like account takeover driven SIM swap fraud, right? We are seeing similarly that you know, AI is very helpful at just detecting patterns that maybe even are, you know, yeah. our employees aren't. So to give you a use case, I mean, so it, look, these fraudsters, these hackers are, are really, really good. Uh, you know, I specifically dealt with an issue where someone had some cryptocurrency and you know, they had 2FA and it was going to their phone, right? So two-factor authentication. And they, they were able to quickly enough do a SIM swap get the, the 2FA and remove that person, all of their cryptocurrency. And, you know, we didn't detect it till way afterwards. And this is a couple of years ago, right? But we're getting better at, at detecting that type of fraud, which is, I mean, which is amazing as we start looking at this, but that was a, that was a pretty interesting use case. So there's a, and there's a lot of them out there. Yeah, and I would say we, we at least, in, you know, from the legal department's point of view, yeah, I'm seeing like every single one of those that yes. happens. Um, and yeah, I would say that, that that's a really interesting comment because it, it also highlights, um, at least for us in our sort of ecosystem, right? There's also the, the trust issues with who's allowed to access, right? So that's also, you know, you're talking your third party uh, you know, dealers that are maybe able to perform SIM swaps, right? Those credentials become important. And then monitoring all those separate networks that aren't just like even your own core. Right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. And there's even, I mean, we have problems with, you know, we have these uh, re retail advocates in, in some cases, and obviously not very many, where it's just, it's, it's very, it's very hard uh, to set policies in place that protect everybody's data. So right. trying to monitor that uh, proactively uh, using AI and ML has been a, a huge effort on our side. That's, that, that's good to hear because it's on our side, it's a big problem for us. And we certainly, uh, that's also how we're attacking it because similarly, the policy angle doesn't seem to, uh, doesn't, seem, doesn't seem to work sufficiently. Sean, what, um, what are you seeing on, on that particular network optimization and that sort of stuff with AI? Yeah, so um, AI is essentially everywhere inside the network now, as you guys would see. Um, and it's a bit of a pity, right? Because it's, you know, many, many years of fantastic engineering is being thrown out the window as we start looking at these data-driven approaches, right? So, um, you know, even down to the physical layer now, these highly engineered, you know, they say 5G radios, et cetera, now are completely being thrown out with end-to-end -end machine learning models that are driving the whole thing. And um, it's fascinating work, right? If you if you think about it, because people didn't think that these things were possible, right? We, had, we really thought we had gotten every bit out of these solutions that we're driving. And now we're seeing these end-to-end -end machine learning solutions able to outperform uh, these classical solutions. And more than that, and you mentioned it quickly, is on top of the physical layer, you have the higher layer. So things like self-optimized, self-organized networks. Uh, we are starting to see solutions that rather than these golden parameters, right? Like where, so maybe you don't know this a dirty little secret, when they put up towers in the sky there, lots of times there's just really smart people who've done this for 30 years, know how to tune these radio heads and put them up there, right? But there's better ways. Of course, things like reinforcement learning gives you ways to 
react with the space, learn from the space, and then optimize these radio heads to give yourself better performance, et cetera. And then, of course, on top of that, you guys are talking about the application layer, right? And so what we're seeing now a lot is new applications that are driven from the emergence of machine learning solutions, things that are able to not only learn from the network and react to it. You talked about ideas like network as a code where you're able to uh, simply you know, change the network uh, through interacting with it like it is a programmable thing, which is crazy if you think about it. Networks are hugely complicated things. The idea that you could code your network is crazy, uh, but also applications that are aware of how the network is performing and make different decisions. Perhaps you'll drive your robot down the left side of the hallway rather than the right because connectivity is better on the left. And these are all things that are learned solutions that are on top of that um, as well. That's so incredibly interesting. Um, just, yeah, as someone who doesn't deal with that, I'm like, a so I guess where I would kind of go with that, I, it really interests me when you're talking about, like, especially tuning the radios. I don't think I had fully appreciated that that was an entirely automated or AI-driven process, even at this point. So it's, it's literally, as they set up the equipment, thinking about, like, say, a Nokia radio, right? How... What does that look like for a tech these days, as opposed to what it looked like maybe five years ago? <laughs> yeah, well, it's not. I mean, because, and I guess that gets into the next thing that we are going to talk about, challenges in bringing ML to the uh, to the telco space. Is telco is a traditional industry, right? right? And we run into lots of challenges. So we have these as uh, proof of concepts that we're deploying in various radios across the United States and Canada, et cetera, right? To show that these things are better. But there's a shift that needs to happen. The shift leads to the roadblocks that we are going to talk about are the things that are challenging the telecommunication industry. And some of them are the traditional things that you see uh, in any industry, right? Like data is obviously a problem, access to high quality data, but networks actually produce more data than you can possibly imagine. Like think of, that. Yeah, think of a fiber optic cable running between the ocean and the amount of data that comes off those things, right? So even just creating a data plane on top of that becomes quite prohibitive. And this is not even getting into the legal rights. I mean, data is, we think of these things as utilities and no one really wants, you guys don't want to be tracked while you're in the room here. Right. And that, I think that's, that's one of the, as the legal department, one of the things we deal with uh, uh, quite often, I would say, from regulators and prior party litigants is that they routinely think that we have, we keep way more data than we actually do because of, as you said, like the sheer volume of it and the sheer granularity of it is just such that even keeping like a sector, let alone, like, or a, even a site really is just cost prohibitive over periods that are are much longer than something measured in days as opposed to even months or years. Yeah, and we were talking a little bit about GPT-3 before we got on the stage here for summarizing uh, textual data, which you guys all know is this thing, let's call it, in the States that people have differing f feelings about. But, right. you know, you, you, of course, you need to take the most important data that comes off the network. And so these data, things like summarization, feature extraction, all these things become critically important when you're thinking about these networks and how to optimize them. Well, and it's, it's also interesting because, at least for me, I before, so this is a little bit of background about me, but during the uh, Department of Justice second request for the Sprint and T-Mobile merger, I handle all of our data productions for it. What surprised me most was the disagreements that our engineers and our experts would have, especially with like the FCC's experts about what KPIs were meaningful across the network. You know, we would get these requests from the DOJ and the FCC and they would say, oh, well, this is clearly what's meaningful. And our people would be like, we literally, we literally throw that out the second it's created. We don't, we don't have it. Um, so that's really interesting to, and to think about how like, I guess this is a question I have is, is that something in development where like in the future, you guys are going to be giving us much more well, directed KPIs and directed flows like that, where it isn't so much like our engineers choosing it. Because that's, that's at least a little bit interesting to me because when you're describing that like self more AI directed process, that's, it's very different from the process I'm accustomed to interfacing with a team, which doesn't mean that that doesn't exist at another layer, right? But just what I am faced with. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think you're going to run into accountability issues really fast here, right? right? Like there's this massive outage in 
Canada and Rogers network went out for like four days and everyone lost their mind um, for good reason, right? 911 went down right across the country, et cetera, right? Which is horrible. Um, and I think a bit of what you're describing, why automation, this is another challenge that we run up against is, you know, accountability, right? And these ideas with responsible AI, et cetera, start to really hit you in the face, right? And the idea that you want to know why your network is going down, you want to be able to fix it and you want to be able to respond to these things quickly. So I think the answer is, it's going to have to be a partnership, right, between the service providers, the people who are building it, and, you know, ultimately the technicians who have boots on the ground to understand these things, et cetera. So. That's, that's such an interesting point, John. And amazingly, that didn't even come up in our prep. So that's, that's a cool detail to get. None of this is scripted. Exactly I can probably right. say that. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. Um, the um, <laughs> so the, the next area that we had uh, identified as a use case was uh, marketing. I think I'm throwing that over to you first on marketing. Um, probably not a great idea, but um, I do have one interesting marketing story, right? Um, and one of the things that, maybe, just a use case, actually, that I could just talk about quickly here. I thought about it on the plane over is we were working with a provider who will remain nameless, and they were a CSI, right? Is that the right term? It's a customer index for how happy they are with your network, oh. et cetera. Um, we were working with them to provide a better metric uh, for that. Um, and the interesting thing is, it, it, everyone knows this is another challenge, of course, with using AI inside any industry is actually asking the right question is always the problem, right? And so what they said is they said these numbers need to be more actionable. We don't know what to do with them. And the problem is, is that they did what anyone reasonable would do when you're looking at customer index. What do we do, right? We look at demographics, right? And we say, okay, this is how happy, you know, this person of this whatever gender and this, you know, location is happy. But the problem with those stats is you can't actually change those stats. Someone is what they are and you can't force them to do something else with their life, I guess. Right. But, um, and so actually, it goes back to your original question of what to keep and what not to keep. We actually showed them that they should be looking at different things because these are things that a network provider, et cetera, could change. And through changing the particular KPIs that they were looking at inside the network, they became a set of actionable network um, items. And so they could change these things. They could change the throughput. They could change, you know, uh, whatever, the jitter or whatever on their network in certain areas. And this actually we can show has a dramatic, a dramatic impact on how happy people are across the usage of their network. So um, it's a good example of how data science merged into predictive models that actually lead it to something that we could actually change the network for for the better to help to improve people's um, perception of the network or, you know, how much they uh, like their YouTube, I guess, or TikTok. Yeah. That's actually a great story because that I would say that even though like the way in which I use AI is is different, one of the key problems and key challenges I face is, is as you said, asking the right question. Because if you don't, then it's very difficult to get to action because everyone wants to use like the cool new thing and to be able, you know, but at the, at the end of the day, you still have to produce a result. Um, so Mitch, you got any, uh, any thoughts on that? For marketing? I mean, not really my space, but I will say that we've got a, you know, it's a multifaceted approach, right? So if you look at just even standard things that we're talking about here, obviously we're using uh, chatbots. Obviously we're uh, working in a way that helps our, our agents uh, in resolving issues. Uh, but we're also looking at, of course, we have models for churn, uh, you know, we have next best, best actions for our sales reps, all of those things that you, you see in a, a standard marketing sales. Uh, but we're also looking at uh, some of what Sean was talking about, our network, right? So being able to predict and, not, and maybe not even predict, but being able to detect issues before it becomes a big problem, before they're calling the, the IVR, before they're on that chat bot, right? Getting into that space of, can we fix this? You know, whether it's jitter, whether it's ping, it doesn't even matter, right? Whatever it is, can we fix this for this particular person ahead of a call? So that's part of the future that I was talking, going to talk to, but is definitely uh, where we're headed, right? We want to be able to have, um, you know, a network that adapts and not just when there is a problem or equipment failed, but do it proactively. Right. I think that, I was going to go into sort of the customer experience yeah. like mob, but I think like that, as you were saying, like that, that's something that we're also uh, doing as well, you know, especially with like, you know, how uh, calls are assigned and things of that nature. That's another, that's definitely another aspect of that. 
Um, and I was just going to touch on two areas that I see at least as like uh, an in-house counsel for a telecom company. And I think this one at least I think is applicable across the board, but it's uh, information governance. Uh, that's one area where I'm seeing a huge increase in the amount I'm using AI because, uh, you know, at T-Mobile, we have over 2,000 databases uh, and managing those is, is a bit of a challenge. So oftentimes when I get a request to say, uh, decommission a database, right, especially if it contains PII, customer information, uh, we have to make an assessment of that every time as to what, you know, whether we can decommission it and whether it needs to be retained. Uh, so I, we found especially the AM, IAM models are amazing at churning through these huge chunks of data and giving us defensible summaries for like what, you know, what kind of fields are in here, what kind of data is in here, like how much are you looking at, like what would be the cost of like going through here and doing a more, a more detailed review. Um, so for us at least, that's, that's been one that's, that I'd see a lot of growth in, at least in the next five to 10 years. Because again, like these, the number of systems that we have are proliferating a lot of times. And, you know, as you see, especially in the great resignation with the kind of churn that we've had, a lot of times the people who created or maintained these databases sometimes are lost and it's difficult to, to get back on track with that. Um, so kind of switching gears here, uh, the next thing we wanted to talk about were sort of the challenges to implementation with AI. Um, and Sean, I, I'm trying, which, which topic do you think would be, I could, cause we could look at this at a number of levels, right? We can look at it as there are like regulatory challenges, right? There are, you know, company specific challenges. There are software challenges. You know, there's a bunch of levels you could look at this, but which one do you find interesting and or worth, worth discussing here? Yeah, so we already talked a little bit about uh, the data challenge, right, uh, in these in, in telecom industries in general, right, and the sure amount of data. Uh, there's quite a bit of data privacy, as we talked about, right, because it is a highly regulated industry as well. Um, yeah, I think maybe perhaps the most interesting thing to me uh, in the challenges in the AI space is just how much we need to change as an industry to kind of adopt these these technologies. Um, I guess for startups, right, it's pretty natural to just buy your GPU and, you know, set up your data, set up your code and um, actually just get these solutions out the door, right? But, a, you know, a, tel a tower and, you know, you have your server maybe at the base the base of it, et cetera, and then you have your backhaul and all the stuff that connects it. It's not actually set up inherently to run all these AI solutions on these things. And this actually turns out to be more challenging than you would think, even if you come up. So we, like I said, we, we rebuilt the 5G radio head now so that it's completely driven by AI end to end. There's, you know, nothing in it except for maybe fast Fourier transform, if you know what that is. Um, but it's hard to actually rebuild the radio because once you say, okay, we have this disruptive solution, then you have to start at the ground, at the bottom up and really rebuild and say, okay, well then what does a 5G radio head look like, right? I'm going to need some sort of AI acceleration there. And then, then you have to start asking very interesting questions like, well, how big can my model be, right? I can't actually run some of these massively over-parameterized models and, you know, even though they provide the great performance that I just was talking about so you can't use that so what are you going to do then well then you have to you know then that's when the math comes in and i start crying a little bit you start looking at these models and you you have to make them small enough and then you have to start asking questions okay what does the you know the chip industry look like like how fast will cheap you know sufficiently powerful ai accelerators be on the market and right building all these things together becomes a very interesting and compelling story about how the ai in, or the ai industry Maybe it's the same thing. The telecom industry will change in the next few years. And I think when I think about where we're going and what excites me the most, I think it's ideas like this where AI is coming in um, and kind of disrupting from the inside, right? It's, it's uh, you know, you likely need the telecommunication companies to go after it, but it's it's being driven, uh, this upheaval, and I, I, it's very exciting. And I think it changes a lot of things down the road. Yeah, that's such, that's such an interesting answer because yeah, when you were saying that earlier, that isn't a change that I had really envisioned. Is you know the again the guts of the network really driving it, but that makes that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Mitch, your yeah, I mean, same concept, right? We have, if you want to call it technical debt, built up over the last 30, 40, 50 years, um, you know, on top of the hardware issue, 
and uh, an investment too, right? If we're going in there, we've now we've got to rip all that out, put something else in that's that's new that will that will serve this purpose. Uh, you start trying to bring those models to the edge. You've got to figure all that out, especially when we look at IoT. You, these small internet devices are not going to have the compute power that your phone has on purpose. And you so, can play Doom on them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some, <laughs> but you, these 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 things are going to be small, and and the logic is is not going to be uh, in the power of the device any longer, right? And so you've now got this 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 big challenge uh, that Sean appropriate art, appropriately articulated. Uh, for me, I think other than that, which is huge, and other than the regulation, which is huge, uh, you know, you've got the other side of this, which everybody faces. Data democratization, right? Quality data, you've got to have it. On top of that, you've got to have an infrastructure in place for, for your AI applications when, when they're built. Uh, on top of that, you've got to have something that's going to give you uh, fairness, governance, uh, your, your, your metrics and monitoring, all that has to be in place. And once you've solved that, then you can start looking at, you know, Hey, how are we going to use AI uh, for all of our, our future pursuits? And, and again, all is the wrong term for the pursuits that make sense for AI. Right. And I think that that's a really good point because it's and it's so difficult to sort of uh, parse that because and then as Sean kind of mentioned, the, the regulatory environment for us as telecoms is quite a bit different from, you know, your your Google or, you know, anybody else really, because we are functionally a regulated utility. So, you know, we have to deal with FCC Section 220. We've got to deal with a whole bunch of rules and regulations that even, you know, the the really big players don't really have to, um, don't really have to handle. Um, I see we're kind of getting on in time a little bit. Uh, so, the next topic we wanted to talk about was uh, you know, basically the critical factors for success. So we've sort of gone over what are the use cases, what are the challenges, and next we're going to talk about a little bit, you know, how. To, but given all that, how do we still make it succeed in our industry, and how do we kind of grow as an industry? And we're going to kick it over to Mitch. Yeah. So I think we kind of touched on this, right? So overcoming those problems uh, really is setting us up for for success. So you know, how do we overcome those problems? That's that's a challenge to each their own, right? So if we look at within AT and T, we uh, our, our CDO organization has really spent time working on these problems, getting the right people in place, making sure that we have data quality and that it's accessible to everyone, um, and then getting governance. We have an application called SIFT in place that that really is the governance, it monitors bias and fairness, etc. Um, so. Yeah, overcoming those things are going to be critical for telecom success. And again, I'll add on what what Sean brought up too, right? So uh, making sure we have the infrastructure in place. Yeah, I think another key challenge, and you just alluded to this a little bit, making sure you have the right people is talent, right? Mm -hmm. I think is a huge problem for all AI industries right now. We're just simply not putting out enough qualified I do mean qualified people, right? It's not just people who have an idea of what data is. I mean, lots of these challenges are really hard and they do tra take fully qualified machine learners and data scientists and mathematicians to go after these problems. And I mean, one of the ways that we're tackling that challenge is, is and you see some of the examples if you walk through the booth too, is we're, we're building tools that assist people to be better at their jobs, right? So we're building data scientists tool kits, right, that allow data scientists to be more than they are, right? And this is really because we just see the same challenges come up again and again and again, right? And then we start to build these toolkits on top of this. So, uh, but I do think that talent uh, is a huge challenge going forward. And then I just, I'm just going to say again, because, you know, this responsible AI, all, both of you have talked about it. I, I think it's, it's always been easy to say we're a pipe and so we don't need to be super responsible, but it's all these use cases show again and again and again that things like, you know, privacy, security, um, understandability, uh, transparency, sustainability of these networks, and then governance of these networks are just things that are critical for any AI solution going forward. And it's, you know, it's, it's not just the telco space that needs to be worried about this. It's everyone actually has to kind of look, take a look in the mirror and start saying, what can I do to drive these issues forward? So we have 
plot, yeah, I just wrote a blog on responsible AI. You can go look it up. I think you can probably find it in my profile if you're interested uh, about what we're doing and what do we think are the six pillars and why do we think that these are important and we'll have more information uh, on that coming out. But uh, it's, you know, I think it's pretty key that as an AI industry, we start thinking about these things because, uh, you, you know, <laughs> GPT-3, I can just rag on it all day long. It's a wonderful thing, but it's just, man, does it have some serious problems that people could have just asked the questions before they built it, right? Like they just had to ask the questions and say, well, what could someone who's not a nice person do with this model? And it, it wouldn't have taken them longer than five minutes. So. Hi. <laughs> or just like post it on Reddit, right? And look at the give it to Reddit or, or even better, YouTube. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just check out the YouTube comment section on it, right? <laughs> um, and then right there, you'll get probably all, uh, or at least enough. Enough. Uh, yeah. Ideas. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think we're kind of getting close to time here. So I, we did want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So I'm going to skip ahead to a little bit, uh, cause I was going to give a little bit on the regulation of AI specifically in, in our industry, but I think it'll be more interesting to hear from these two guys as to where they think this industry is going in the future. Mitch, you touched on that a little bit already. Um, yeah, but, but I've got more, you're right, but, he's, but he has more, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, get, you guys are getting what you paid for. Yeah. So no, I think this is my favorite topic, right? So where are we headed? And it's not just AI. Uh, I know this is an AI conference. But let's talk about other enablers, 5G and cloud, okay? So if we look at 5G and the technology that it provides, it gives us the ability as a, a simple example, simple use case to slice networks. So as an example, let's talk about network as a service or networks on demand. We kind of talked about it a little bit. So imagine that you want to extend your company's network to all of your remote workers without VPN. Well, that's possible now. Uh, so we have enabled this. There's, you know, again, it, this is coming in, in the future. This is not out in production right this second. Um, but you can self-service that network. Let's talk about the gaming experience. So if you look at gaming, you know, there's three attributes that are in incredibly important. You've got your ping, your bandwidth, and jitter. Okay. And in, important in gaming isn't just the fastest speed. It's consistency, okay? And having a consistent ping is more important than having something a super low ping. And so uh, imagine that we create a network for your clan, whatever, your gaming group uh, that you can self-serve at any point. And we use AI to manage those attributes for you automatically to learn over time and make it even better for you, okay? So that's one thing. Now, if we look at uh, just... Sorry, I gotta look over my notes. So yeah, all right, forget the notes. So the, uh, the other side of this is if we look at our network and what we've done to, to manage the network a little bit better. Some of those ideas are using drone imagery in a different way. So as we now find anomalous data in our in attendant, attendant interference, basically, uh, we can dispatch drones to, to go out check the towers, and using computer vision, detect whether, hey, it's skewed antenna, bird's nest, rusted cable, et cetera. And what took us months to detect and fix is now into a couple of days, right? And so we, we've, we've gone in here and, and, and started to get these things built. We've got working prototypes, and they're, they're going to be out there pretty soon. And then on top of that, because we are very short on time, and we're getting like the go minute, and I want to give Sean time here, um, is that the uh, the other side of this is we've democratized AI at AT&T. So I don't even know what the use cases are going to be in the future when you open that up to all the employees and everybody thinking about it. So you don't necessarily need to be a, a data scientist, scientist or a developer. Uh, you know, we've built this citizenry of of open AI, if you will, uh, that, that really democratizes it. So uh, the future is really bright in this industry. Sean, over to you. Yeah, there, I mean, there's a whole lab full of people making really cool things. But I guess um, I already talked a little bit about the radios that are building themselves. Um, I mean, the industry is just changing, right? It's being driven more and more by AI, et cetera. And I think lots of the use cases you just mentioned are very cool from drones automatically inspecting towers, 
um, to, you know, chatbots that allow you to uh, interact and quickly fix the network to th- uh, slicing that is now on demand, et cetera. I don't know if I have too much to add on top of that since we're short on time. So that makes sense. Uh, do we have time for questions or? I think we're running a little bit too close to the wire okay. for questions. So, so if you guys have any questions, please follow up with us uh, afterwards. It was uh, great being here today and thank you all. Thank you all for attending.